The following announcement has been paid for by the New Wealth Management Advisory Club. Hey everybody, it's the president of the Wealth Management Advisory Club, Jack Mitchell. Welcome back to another exciting WMA club meeting, but not just any old WMA club meeting. No, no, no. This is the start of our 10 chapters of our 2023 Spring Break Workshop Spectacular. First time WMA Club we ever doing this. Um, we decided, you know, why not? Help you guys learn learn new stuff while you're still spring break. Even though most of you guys are probably going to be watching this after spring break, which I don't really mind. But again, we're doing this for you guys. We love you guys so much. We decided, why not? We do this as a little fun way to see if this works. And if it doesn't work out, then we're not going to do it again. But hopefully this will work. So over the next 10 days, we're going to get fresh content from the WMA Club for all of our, you know, um, Workshop spectaculars that we have on our schedule right there. You can check our social media pages to see what chapter, what chapter will be on which day and times. And obviously the Zoom links are all in the link tree and our website. Go there, obviously go to that website. Um, not the one that the Silver made, but again. <laughs> um, anyway, so two announcements on our end. And then we're going to send you guys off to chapter one or chapter uno. Real must. <laughs> um, so we decided that we are going to be extending our spring break workshop spectacular. Yeah, we're extended it. Um, because a couple of things have actually happened. And two of them are actually it actually kind of kind of a blessing in disguise. This first one, um, unfortunately with them will not be able to come the 21st to WMA Club um because of some emergencies that they have on their end. So in order to not forfeit a meeting, and on top of that, the last day of the spring break workshop spectacular, we're gonna have two workshops on the same day. And I said to myself, well, they have to have their own separate chapters. They need to have their own separate meetings. So we decided we're extending it by two days. So the final chapter is going to be on March 21st at 6 p.m. in person, Mansion 13, Dickinson Hall, Room 70, Zoom, and WMA Club Socials as well. And then on the 20th, the Investment Due Diligence Workshop, that'll be on the 20th at WMA Club Socials. That'll be at 6 p.m. And obviously, you guys need visuals. There they are. So again, the investment due diligence workshop, which was one of the final two workshops we were doing for the spring break workshop spectacular, they will now be moved to the 20th. That'll be at 6 p.m. on our club socials. And then the 21st, that will be personal finance management. You may have heard of that because it actually is one of the courses that's actually offered at FDU. So I thought, you know, why don't we do that for um, our final chapter here for WMA? Um, spring break workshop attack. Why don't we do that for chapter 12? So that'll be again on the 21st, 6 p.m., Mansion 13, Dixon Hall, Run 70, Zoom, and WMA Club Socials as well. So that's actually the first and the second announcement. The last announcement I'm going to make uh, we are going to be setting up our 2023 fall semester schedule. If you guys know of any speakers you guys want us to bring for WMA Club, I want you guys, actually, I'm really want you guys to put that in the comment section go to our group me see one of our e-board members ask me ask our advisor professor koza ask any of us and we will make that happen for next semester because we are not going to be revealing the schedule yet it'll probably be released in probably around june or maybe in the fourth of july weekend maybe just a little hint there we might be doing that um and i can also confirm um and this is actually as of today that the room situation for next semester in the fall for Florum will be in the mansion room 12. So if we do decide, because we are not there yet, we're still halfway through the semester. If we decide that we're going to do, again, bonus meetings again in the fall, all the meetings will be held in mansion room 12. So you guys don't have to worry about that. Finally, we have that room all to ourselves for that semester. So I'm very excited about that. Um, but again, anything can happen. So again, that's not in stone just yet. Um, I have to figure out my schedule to figure out our e-board schedule. So hopefully, you know, we'll all will show up. So with that out of the way, if you guys are ready, I know I am most certainly ready. Let's get you guys off to chapter one, our spring break workshop spectacular. And you guys will get that special intro. Yes, no, none of that lying yet. Not that, because that will be Thursday. You guys are going to see that on Thursday. But you guys have watched last week's meeting, which was Thursday. You saw the new intro for not only our bonus meetings and our spring break workshop spectacular. Some guys been to see the spring break workshop spectacular intro right now. So let's send you guys off to the to the bonus, not the bonus meeting, 
I'm sorry, I'm going to have to get used to this because we're doing 12 of these. <laughs> Dang. Uh, let's send you guys off to your first chapter of Spring Break Workshop Spectacular. <laughs>
who make decisions based on all available information and that financial markets are efficient, meaning that asset prices reflect all available information. It also emphasizes the use of mathematical models and statistical analysis to make investment decisions. So you probably didn't even ask yourself this, and I know we talked about psychology being implemented in behavioral finance, but how does behavioral finance incorporate psychology into making these financial decision-making processes? Well, let me explain how that works. So behavioral finance incorporates a psychology into financial decision-making in several ways. One key area of focus is on understanding and identifying cognitive biases and emotional influences that can affect investment decisions. Behavioral finance also explores how these biases and influences may differ from across different individuals and groups. And another important aspect of this is based on the study of heuristics or mental shortcuts, which I'll explain that once we get to these, not the next, the next couple slides. Basically, the individual is used to simplify complex decision-making processes. By understanding how these heuristics work and how they lead to biases and errors in judgment, behavioral finance can help investors make more informed and rational investment decisions. And finally, it also explores how social and cultural factors may influence financial decision making. For example, cultural norms around risk aversion, which I'll talk about that in a little bit, or attitude towards the debt may influence investment decisions in ways that they're not accounted for in the traditional financial models. So now let's talk about cognitive biases. See, cognitive, using your brain, making it interactive for you guys. I know you guys are all watching this, where you guys are, or, um, at your lunch break, or on the beach, or a plane or a car or hopefully not driving hopefully with uh, bluetooth mode on hopefully just listening or maybe your peer doing some work and you just pop by and just listen to me make on you so so cognitive biases are inherent flaws in human thinking that can lead to errors in judgment and decision making these biases are the result of the brain's attempt to process and inter interpret 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 in information quickly and efficiently but can result in irrational and suboptimal decision making and here are some examples of cognitive biases in financial decision making. So we have loss aversion. Loss aversion is the tendency to prefer avoiding loss or achieving gains of, e of equal value. This bias can lead investors to hold, hold on to losing investments for way too long or avoiding taking on appropriate levels of risk in their portfolios. Overconfidence. Obviously, you guys looked at word up in the dictionary, but Troy was uh, living under a rock and he used to understand what overconfidence is. Let me explain that. Overconfidence is the tendency to overestimate one's own ability, knowledge, or expertise. The bias, this bias can lead investors to take on excessive risk in their portfolio or to make investment decisions without conducting sufficient research and analysis. Now we have confirmation bias. Bear in mind, you're probably going to hear that phrase a lot this workshop. So just bear in mind, I might repeat myself twice unless I catch myself. So <laughs> confirmation bias is the tendency to seek out information that confirms existing beliefs or opinions while ignoring information that could contradicts those beliefs. This bias can lead to suboptimal investment decisions based on incomplete or biased information. Hindsight bias. Yes, you never know. There was a hindsight bias. Hindsight bias is the tendency to view past events as more predictable than they actually were. This bias can lead investors to make the mistake of assuming that they could have predicted past market movements or events leading to overconfidence in future investment decisions. And finally, anchoring biases. Anchoring biases is the tendency to rely too heavily on the first piece of information encountered, encountered when making a decision. This bias can lead to could lead investors to be over influential over influenced by the initial stock prices or other factors when making investment decisions. So now we're finally going to talk about heuristics. You guys probably never heard that word. And if you probably are in psychology, you psychology major, you may have heard of it. But for those business majors who have never heard this word in your life, and believe me, it's the first time I ever heard this ever, let me explain what this is. So Heuristics are mental shortcuts or rule of thumb or rule of thumb that individuals use to simplify decision making processes. These heuristics can be used in, useful in many situations as they can save time and cognitive resources. However, they can also lead to biases and error in judgment when applied inappropriately. And some examples of these are as follows. And I'm not going to explain the ones I just explained already for cognitive biases, but the ones I'll explain that are new. Like, for example, availability heuristics. The availability heuristics is the tendency to rely on readability available information on examples for making decisions. For example, an investor may base their investment decision on recent news headlines or events rather than on comprehensive research. We then have represent, rep 
representativeness heuristic. The representative heuristic is the tendency to make a judgment based on how similar something is to a typical example or stereotype. For example, an investor may choose to invest in a company because it fits the stereotype of a successful investment, even if it is, may not have a strong underlying fundamentals. We already talked about anchoring, so I'm not going to talk about that. We we're talking about confirmation biases, we're not going to talk about that. So we'll talk about now about framing effect. So the framing effect is the tendency to make a different decision based on how information is presented. For example, an investor may be more likely to invest in a stock if it is presented as having a potential gain of 20% rather than a potential loss of 80%. Okay, next we'll talk about emotional biases. Yes, there are biases in the emotional. I'm trying to make it funny. <laughs> so emotional biases are psychological tendencies that can impact financial decision-making. These biases can be caused by emotions such as fear, greed, and regret aversion, and can lead to irrational or suboptimal investment decisions. So here are some examples of those in the financial decision-making process. And again, I'm not going to talk about confirmation biases because we already talked about that already, but the other four I will talk about. Fear. Fear can lead to tendency of over, to overreact to negative events or news, causing investors to sell their stock at a loss or avoiding interest altogether. This can lead to, lead to missed opportunities for growth and potential returns. Fear could also cause investors to avoid taking on appropriate levels of risk in their investment portfolio. Greed. Get it? Greed. The color of money. Green. Green greed. <laughs> greed can lead to a tendency can lead to a tendency of chase high returns or to take on excessive risk in hope of achieving greater profits. This can lead to impermanent investment decisions and potentially significant ish losses. Now we have regret aversion. Regret aversion is the tendency to avoid making a decision or taking a risk that could lead to regret in the future. This can, this can lead to missed opportunities for growth and potential returns. And then finally, loss aversion. Loss aversion is a tendency to prefer avoiding losses over achieving gains or of equal value. This can lead to investors holding on, holding on to loss, losing investments for too long, or avoiding taking on appropriate levels of risk of their portfolio. In the portfolio, per se. So, we want to talk about market anomalies. So, market anomalies are patterns or trends that cannot be explained by traditional finance theories, such as the efficient marketing market hypothesis. These anomalies suggest that the market is not always efficient and that the investors can potentially achieve higher returns by exploiting these market efficiencies. And here are some of the market anomalies that are there. And thankfully, we'll talk, talk about all of them. So the movement effect. The mo momentum effect refers to the tendency for stocks that have performed well in the past to continually perform well in the future. And for stocks that perform poorly in the past to continue to perform in the future. So basically, it's a direct relationship. If it's going well, it's going to stay doing well. If it's doing bad, it's going to continue to do bad. This effect is inconsistent with the efficient market, market hypothesis, which assumes that the stock price always reflects on all available information. Then we have value effect. The value effect is the tendency for stocks that are undervalued by traditional finance metrics, such as price to earnings or price to book ratios. You guys probably learned that in your FICA classes. If you not know what I just said there with FICA, that is CFA studies. For anyone who goes to FDU and knows that joke, pat yourself on the back um, because you got the joke. <laughs> Tap for stocks that are overvalued. This anomaly suggests that the market sometimes undervalues certain stocks and that the investors can achieve higher returns by investing in their undervalued stocks. Size effect. The size effect is the tendency for smaller companies to outperform larger companies this anomaly suggests that smaller companies may be more agile and better to are able to capitalize on new opportunities compared to larger, more established companies. For example, um, Rumble to do better than, than Google, as an example. <laughs> if anyone gets that, again, pat yourself on the back for that. If you were after you, you understand that that uh, tie there. <laughs> pat yourself on the back. All right, overreaction and underreaction. You may be wondering why did I set, why I put them both together and not separate them. Well, just listen to this. Overreaction and underreaction are market anomalies that suggest that the market sometimes overreacts to new information, causing stocks to be overvalued or undervalued, and then underreacts, causing the stock price to eventually adjust to its true value. For example, and uh, forever, you know who you are. I apologize I have to use this reference. Um, for example, Zynex not posting their quarter four earnings and the stock went pounding down and then it rebounded up after they post their earnings after they you know they did it because of delay so i'm sorry i had to use that example i'm sorry but if you're in smeep you get the joke <laughs> 
Finally, the seasonality effect. The seasonality effect is the tendency for stocks to perform differently depending on the time of year. For example, stocks may perform better in the fourth quarter due to increased consumer spending during the holiday season. All right, let's talk about now the investor types. So there's three types of investors. There's the passive, there's active, and there's value. See, active, running, running, value like a diamond, and passive, you know, psych. We're going to talk about all three of these types of investors and also talk about how cognitive biases, heuristics, and emotional biases and the market anomalies that we just talked about earlier impact these different types of investors. So let's start with a passive one. See, towels. <laughs> So passive investors believe in the efficient market hypothesis, which suggests that the market always reflects all available information and is impossible to consistently beat the market. Passive investors invest in low cost index funds or ETFs and hold on, hold on them for long term. For example, student managed investment fund club, they invest for the long term. They are then considered passive investors, not active or the value ones. Because again, they're in for the long term, not for short term. Passive investors are less likely to be influenced by cognitive and emotional biases because they rely on the assumption of efficient markets. However, they, they can still be impacted by market anomalies such as the momentum effect or the value effect. Passive investors should be aware of the market anomalies and adjust their investment strategies accordingly. So the next type is the active investors. So active investors believe that the market is inefficient and that it is possible to beat the market by finding undervalued stocks or timing the market. Active investors engage in frequent trading and are more likely to use technical analysis and market timing to make investment decisions. For example, day traders, as an example, they are active investors. Active investors are more prone to cognitive and emotional biases because they engage in frequent trading and rely on their own decision making. They may be more susceptible to overconfidence, confirmation biases, and the sunk cost fallacy. Active investors should be aware of their cognitive biases and use strategies such as diversification and risk management to mitigate their impact. You guys want to hear about risk management workshop? Go watch that after this workshop because we did do a workshop on that. Probably was the best minute in risk management workshop. So, you know, throw that other plug out there for us. Finally, we have the value investor. So value investors focus on finding undervalued stocks by analyzing a company's financial statements and market conditions. They typically have a long-term investment horizon aimed to generate their returns through buying undervalued stocks and holding them until the market recognizes their true value. Value investors rely heavily on fundamental analysis and may be less affected by cognitive biases that impact short-term traders. However, they may be influenced by heuristics such as the representative's heuristics, which may lead them to faulty assumptions based on limited information. And value investors should be aware of limited ages of the fundamental analysis and incorporate other sources of information into their investment decision-making process. So, to sum this all up, in conclusion, Behavioral finance is the field of study that integrates psychology and finance to explain how investors make financial decisions. So, for example, remember when I talked about IMA, when I talked about accounting and finance managers, mash them together, best of both worlds. Basically, like that psychology and finance, mash them together, best of both worlds. That's behavioral finance. Cognitive biases are mental shortcuts that can lead to irrational decision making. And examples of cognitive biases include loss, aversion, overconfidence, and confirmation biases. Heuristics are mental shortcuts that can lead to efficient, de efficient decision making but they can also lead to errors. Emotional biases are feelings of emotion that in, can also influence the decision-making process. Market anomalies are patterns that cannot be explained by traditional finance. Understanding behavioral finance can help invest individuals or investors make better financial decisions. By being aware of cognitive and emotional biases, individuals can make more rational decisions. Additionally, individuals can benefit from learning about market anomalies such as the value effect, which suggests that undervalued stocks tend to outperform stocks in the long run. And financial advisors and institutes can benefit from understanding behavioral finance to better serve their clients by being aware of the kind of an emotional biases. All right, so that is it for chapter one of our spring break workshop spectacular. Yes, I do know it was probably a short meeting, um, but again, these are going to be what you guys are going to watch. Because again, we don't want to make these an hour long. You guys can sit through all of them. What you guys should watch for 30 minutes be like a TV show. You watch it for 30 minutes with no ads, obviously. And you go back out there, do we got guys got do we gotta do, obviously. So with that being said, the next time you guys are gonna see me, which will be tomorrow, yes, you're gonna see me this beautiful face the next 11 days after today, we will be doing chapter number two, which is with my handy dandy sheet here, 
debt management workshop. We all don't want to go into debt. So again, tomorrow, March 11th, debt management workshop, hosted by yours truly, Daniel Club President Jack Mitchell. And by the way, I forgot to mention in the beginning, every single one of these workshops that we do, and I forgot to send this out to you guys. If you guys are an FDU student, um, this actually does apply to you. If anyone's not an FDU student, just, you know, I'll see you next, see you tomorrow. But for those of you students, I did apologize that I forgot to actually send you guys the mega workshops folder. So what I'm going to do is at the end of the spring break workshop spectacular, I am going to send you guys a link to view not only our mega workshops, but every single spring break workshop what we've done for the spring break workshop spectacular, all of them for you guys to view for your own pleasure, whatever you guys want to do with them. I don't care if you guys don't use them, if you use them, great. Um, but again, they'll all be there for you guys to view on your own time. So with that being said, that is it for chapter one. We'll see you guys tomorrow for chapter two. And this is Jack Rosick. So long. Have a great rest of your Friday and we will see you on Saturday. Bye-bye.